recording. All right, now I'd like to invite First Affirmative to begin the debate. Hello, um, I'm Lucy and my pronouns are she, her. I rely on scare tactics to succeed. When we're able to make people stand their ground, we make it more likely that you're able to repel them and therefore end piracy, which is really, really good. Two points in the speech. Firstly, on how we increase the success of repelling pirates on container shifts. And secondly, on how that leads to less pirates and ending piracy overall in a really good way. Firstly, though, on how we reduce pirates. We tell you that most pirates are relatively easily repelled and the ones who are not easily repelled are not contained under this motion because it's where you would be able to repel them reasonably. Why is this the case? Uh, first, firstly, they don't have that many resources available to them because they are generally outlaws. They're living a life of like, you know, going from place to place, trying to scavenge up as much as they can. They don't have the same capacity to defend themselves as places do. And secondly, because they're often relying on things like scare tactics. So they rely on the fact that the guards might run away and that if you were actually able to just shoot back at them, they would often just go away and they wouldn't be something that stayed with you for very long. So under the status quo, we think often what happens is they're able to succeed based on these scare tactics. The reason for that is that the incentive is for you as a guard to not stand your ground. And the reason for that is that the possible consequences of you not standing your ground is that you might lose your job, which is not that strong an incentive because if you are someone who is working for these companies on like a ship or something, you can probably get a job somewhere else. You can find somewhere else to work. So it doesn't really matter to you. The contractual consequence is more just that the company itself loses money and the lot, like basically as a result of this piracy, which is not something that you really care about as an individual guard. So you're likely to back down in the face of that because you think maybe there is a chance that I might lose my life and so you are unlikely to take that kind of risk. Why does this change? Two things. Firstly, on the direct individual level for a guard, it's more likely to have a larger impact on your life if you do stand down because the crimin a criminal charge directly affects your capacity to do that. So for example, you might be able to, you might be fined, you might go to prison, or you might just have like generally something on your record, which is really bad for you as a guard in this instance. The second thing to say is that the kind of companies which are contracted to provide security damage, security, often are willing to just like basically cut corners because the contractual out outcome for them is not that big. They might just have to pay some damages, but they make the calculation that it's worth that kind of cost for them to maybe hire someone worse, maybe have to pay damages, but it's something that they're okay to do because this essentially a financial transaction. The comparative is a world, which a world in which the person in charge of a company can be directly targeted with criminal sanctions, for example, if their guards are consistently running away or standing down. That means that they're unlikely to be able to shrug it off to the same extent because, as I told you, a criminal charge is something that is easier to, it's not as hard to shrug off, it's harder to shrug off, something that sticks with you for the rest of your life. What does this mean? I think it means that the company is more likely to do things like hire veterans, not hire people who are just randoms, hire people who are maybe cost more for their them to do but they're willing to do that because they want to avoid that criminal sanction on them it's a choice that they can make because they can prove that they've done the utmost rather than hiring randoms they're more likely to for example equip the ships that they have with better equipment because it's no longer just a cost calculation it's also a calculation of their own person like the, the the sanctions of the company and the criminal sanctions what is okay on to the second point then about how this reduces that basically allows you to repel pirates more easily i think that when people stand their ground in instances where pirates are able to repel because as i told you they aren't they don't have many resources in often cases they will be defeated they will just turn around what does this mean i think it means you get less piracy overall a couple of reasons for this firstly the pirates attack are less likely to be successful that has a couple of key impacts firstly it might just lead to something like them not being able to do it anymore because their ship is sunk or something along those lines right when you actually Actually take away their resources you make it less capable for them to do that in the future and they just can't be pirates anymore but secondly they don't actually get the good 
that they might get from your container ship anymore when you've, they've been repelled. That means they no longer had the resources they need to do things like pay their, sh their pay their crew, just be able to have resources in the first place. That makes them have less capacity to buy weapons in the future. The second thing is that you make it generally riskier and scarier to be a pirate. Under the status quo, because you've used scare tactics and you know that most people will just run away, it is not that risky to be a pirate. In a comparative in which you know that the guards are likely to go against you, and you know that they are likely to be veterans, they are likely to be people who are more scary for you to go up against, you're more likely to, you're less likely to want to be a pirate, that makes it harder for those pirates to get crews, that makes them less likely to be successful. What does that mean? The result is that it's less attractive to be a pirate, so there are less of them, but also when they are less successful, it's generally a self-fulfilling cycle, right? Because if you don't have any many resources, you can no longer attract people towards you, which means you're less likely to be successful in the future, which continually makes it there's less piracy. That is extremely important because there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, pirates are just awful. They do things like murder people in cold blood, they go through and create fear, and they rape people on their ships. This is especially bad because we say, firstly, just in terms of actually going on these pirate container ships, what they also do is they often do things like go on passenger ferries and things like that and target entirely innocent people. What they do is they have the capacity to do that because of the money that they get from things like container ships. So we say that when you no longer allow them to do that anymore, they no longer have the capacity to do things like go after passenger ferries. The second thing to say is that it's really good to stop people from going towards piracy. If we generally discourage them from doing that, they're less likely to get trapped in a cycle of crime which is involved in becoming a pirate because that life is often really rubbish for you. It might be better for them to just not want to do that in the first place and have another opportunity. The third thing to say is that these pirates are also often really harmful when they gain power and influence because they come back to the land that they, when they come back to land, they often become things like warlords because they have a lot of, they have a lot of riches, but also they have the capacity to like basically influence the power that they already have. When we take away that power away from them, we make it far easier to stop pirates, to stop the awful things they do to people. We protect things better. People do not make good choices when they don't have the criminal sanction. They need that threat in order to help them repel pirates, which they would be able to do under our side of the house. Thank you for that speech, first affirmative. And now I'd like to invite the first negative speaker. And please also remember to give me your name and pronouns if you wish. Cool. Um, hi, Harry Hidai, just confirming I can be heard. <clears throat> if I was contracting security guards to protect one of my container ships sailing by Somalia, I would want to make sure there were some bloody strong penalty clauses in that. If there's, uh, if those and guards leave the <clears throat> leave the ship when it is reasonably possible for them to be defended. And what that means is that the only situation where those guards would be leaving and thus encourage <clears throat> would be situations where there was a massive degree of risk towards them on that situation. I don't think it's a good idea to put armed to make people lose their lives for what is fundamentally an economic consideration. I'm going to do three things in this speech. First, why this represents an unjustified expansion of the criminal law that is principally harmful on its own. Second, why economic deterrence is sufficient. Note this directly responds to Lucy's case. Third, why this encourages risk-taking material. First, I'm just going to deal very briefly to this material about <clears throat> less piracy. First, they tell you that it will be less scary for pirates. I'm sorry, but piracy broadly occurs in situations where there's been a complete failure of the state because it's a relative because you need a relatively high degree of state compliance in order for you not to get immediately arrested when you get on back to the ground. What that means is that it takes place exclusively in places like Nigeria, not Nigeria, sorry, Somalia, or other um 
or other states with a relatively low degree of capacity to police them. That means that there's already a massive degree that the situation for them and, and their main, the rest of their lives is relatively harm, um, harmful. There's not much capacity for increased deterrence. That also explains why things like being sunk and you can't pay people, it's still going to be way more, way more profitable than other things like that. Okay, let's deal first with the unjustified expansion of criminal law. First, the fundamental principle of criminal law is that it requires a, a situation so bad that not only are civil penalties inappropriate, that the state must intervene, right? And an important part of that is that you shouldn't, um, criminal law should not apply where other, where other remedies are appropriate, right? We just tell you that other remedies, um, that in this case, the majority of situations, you're not, pirates are not going to kill people and cause consequences, right? Because that's what attracts state attention, that's what gets the US Navy um, to start patrolling your waters, that's what causes you problems. Instead, what you're trying to do is you're trying to steal oil, you're trying to steal cargo, you're trying to pay um, get people to pay hostages. The consequence of that is the majority of harm that pirates cause to the world is an economic harm. They don't want to hurt people because that is the type of thing that leads to Western intervention. That's the type of thing that makes their life really, really difficult. That means that things like, for example, contractual, um, contractual liquidated damages clauses and tortious remedies for the negligence of the guards are entirely appropriate remedies because it's an economic harm being caused to, um, by your net failure to perform your role. It's as such an economic remedy of having to pay back the benefit from that is appropriate. There's a couple of consequences for this. First, we tell you that in most cases, the economic harm is quite severe. This is a problem of um, double punishment. But on a second level, we tell you that in the majority of cases, this is expanding the criminal law to an area where there's no justification for the criminal law to operate, that's incredibly harmful because it's the most oppressive exercise of state authority. It should be constrained as much as possible. Okay, why are economic deterrence <clears throat> sufficient? Three reasons. First, you probably lose your job. Now, Lucy tells you that, oh, but you know, you could probably just go find another job. It's unclear where you're going to get any of the type of references or, or background that is going to allow you to get a new job as an armed guard if you have a track record of running away from ships when they're under attack, right? This is a relatively strong disincentive. But second, we tell you it's a really unattractive job for people, right? It involves spending lots of time away from people. As they explain, it's normally reserved for veterans of um, armed forces and things like that. The consequence of that is it tells you that people who are doing this job are relatively economically desperate at the point that they're making this decision. The important consequence of this is it's incredibly unlikely that they are going to then be willing to... Um, that means that losing the job is a really severe disincentive for them. That means that it's incredibly... It takes a very high bar for that to be satisfied. But then also the company loses money. And Lucy tells you that it's a relatively small penalty. Why? That's blatantly an assertion. At the point that as a shipping company, you risk losing huge amounts of oil or huge amounts of cargo. I don't know. I'd probably just put a clause in the contract that says, hey, if your armed guards leave the ship when it is reasonably possible for them to defend it, you are going to pay us a lot of money. The consequence of that then is that it... <laughs> And the economic deterrence, the economic incentives are directly for companies to ensure that there's a sufficient economic deterrent for these um, companies to operate. Because it's a commercial transaction, right? It's a company paying to reduce its risk of loss on a particular transaction. Yeah, it's piracy, woo, but it is still ultimately economic, so you can provide a sufficient economic disincentive. Why then does this encourage risk-taking back behavior? The important point at the, head, the context at the head of this is what reasonable means in this particular context is it's what a reasonable person would do in the particular circumstances. That means that there's always leeway into what type of behavior is considered leeway, um, is considered to be reasonable in a given context, right? Like there's always judgment calls to be made. There's always individual tolerance for risk. You don't know how this would play out. The consequence of, and, and I'm going to note one thing um, about their case. They've actually made it a lot harder for them now because they're now putting criminal penalties on the top people in the company. Those top people also have control over pay and everyone else in the company. That means that this is going to be a, a, a pressure applied top down. Bear that in mind for the rest of this because it makes all of this worse. We tell you that <laughs> this encourages two particular types of risky behavior. First, it encourages people who are not who don't want to lose their job and are not certain about how reasonable the situation is, trying to contest a situation where it is not reasonable for them to do so, right? We tell you this looks like <clears throat> standing up against pirates who have um, particular capacity to fight back, who particularly have dangerous weapons that make it problematic for them. In a lot of cases, even if it is, it, because we tell you that there's probably like a reasonably continuous spectrum of pirates with different degrees of different degrees of problems for you, this means that there is a solid window where there's a risky behavior that you should step away from. That means you're likely going to contest it. But second, you might delay leaving when it is blatantly too worried because you don't want to be the ones that left your job early when it was reasonable to stay aboard, right? All of those economic disincentives apply. This is really harmful because this increases the risk for everyone on, on, on board that. Okay, so why? <laughs> what are the consequences of this? First, we just tell you more guards die, right? Like more guards contest this, more guards get wounded, get more guards die. But on a second level, we tell you that 
also because they're you're more likely to get violence against the rest of the people on board the ship right because you you have more chance that you get into a fight with them there's more chance of violence there at the end of the day economic deterrence is sufficient there is no justification for the expensive expansion of criminal law Expert speech, and now I'd like to invite first, uh, second affirmative. Um, Peter, here they. Even if it's completely true that um, we like that currently guards are incentivized to fight to the last in all the situations where it's reasonable for them to do so and like don't back away when they otherwise should, we think that that like even if it's true that all we do is incentivize more armed resourced guards to stand up to pirates and make it harder to be a pirate make it worse and less successful, we still win this debate because the people we care about the most are not the armed guards who have volunteered to go in a situation where they might have to fight pirates. It's the civilians that take passenger ferries. It's people living around coasts. It's people like fishermen that rely on those coasts uh, for, for their living. It's the people in areas where there is piracy who are harmed by a continuing cycle of pirates getting more and more resources by robbing container ships. I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. Firstly, I'm going to step through and talk about the different incentives acting um, on like guards. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about what the harms of piracy actually are and why we reduce them. Note that they say that like their point is essentially it's it's unnecessary to add a a, a legal justification when there is already an, an economic imperative, but we like our case is that there is not a sufficient economic imperative, so we just don't think that's true. Okay. We told you firstly that the economic incentives acting on the companies and the individuals are not strong enough for them to act like seriously enough in this case. Important to note here. They tell us that like you'll get big penalties, you'll like lose your reputation, et cetera. You want to be seen as a really effective company. There'll be strong contracts, et cetera. But within the international shipping space, particularly in the kind of areas where like Harry told you that tend to have relatively low levels of law enforcement, relative levels of poverty, so pirates flourish, et cetera. There's obviously a spectrum of different companies that are operating. So there probably are some really expensive private security firms that provide the like best you know, soldiers that like have things that can sink ships, etc. Then there are probably other like relatively shady operators that do have a reputation as being a bit crap, but are also very cheap to hire. And so shipping companies that are like running low on money and need to take more risks, etc., end up hiring the cheap shit operators who do run away at the first sight of pirates. And it the existence of lots of opportunities where guards do run away, lots of shady companies that do put up no resistance, lots of guards who are just there to collect their paycheck and don't really mean care if they get fired, means that it is sustainable to be a pirate in general because there is a relatively high chance that when you run a scare tactic at a ship, they will capitulate and give in to you, right? The existence of a relative chunk of the market that is willing to fall to pirates is enough to make piracy sustainable, and that's the key difference we make here. So firstly, although Harry provides some examples why, like, the best companies obviously have these incentives, we tell you that's not true. 
Secondly, though, uh, like like in addition to like why those bad companies are able to sustain themselves, also we tell you that contractual obligations are much easier to get out of, particularly if you're operating in poorly regulated spaces like the Gulf of Aden, right? Because you can just like declare insolvency, vo like void the contract, go and found a new company called like Anti Piracy Number Two, whatever, and like enter into new contracts. There's probably like it's you know like fighting piracy is not the most transparent and well-known place in the world. What that means is that criminal sanctions that are applied by like international agencies where big sh shipping companies want to make sure that people have like screwed them over and not helped them get prosecuted, it's much harder to dodge a criminal sanction that's directed at you personally rather than a contract that your company's in. So we tell you that we do significantly shift the incentives of all people operating in the field, right? Because now the company, like the shipping contractors don't want to hire the companies that are shipped because they face these penalties, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't do those kind of things in situations where financially you might be incentivized to take risks. Let's now talk about the harms caused by pirates. We hear this ridiculous characterization that the harms of pirates are purely economic, so it's ridiculous to try and insert criminal incentives. Blatantly not true. We told you that part of being a pirate is doing horrible things to people, right? The only real response here is that, like, pirates don't want to attract the ire of the United States Navy, so they don't, like, harm people and they mostly, like, don't hurt people. Two responses. Firstly, since when has the United States government cared about, like, random Somali ferry passengers or, like, fishermen trying to take their boat out in the Philippines, right? The US Navy cares about like lots of money, but not much besides that. So you're incentivized to be really brutal to the most vulnerable people like civilians that no one cares about. But secondly, as pirates, both specifically and in general, being brutal and maiming and hurting and killing people is how you get your reputation that enables you to use scare tactics and be effective in the first place. If pirates were all bark and no bite, no one would give in to them and the whole business model would collapse. So you have to do lots of acts of brutality to make yourself seem really scary so people will capitulate in order to buy into it, right? But thirdly, you're like out in the middle of the fucking ocean. Who's holding you to accountable for like bad things you do to people? What we tell you that means is that Pirates do really nasty, awful things, particularly to civilians who have no ability to control us. We would rather shift the incentives so that armed guards that have signed up to be there do fight pirates more often, even if sometimes they do to pick a fight they probably shouldn't, because it means pirates' boats get sunk, pirates die, pirates have less money, there are less pirates. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I just got my technical mic with missile with me. Peter and I can never be pirates now, because this debate is reported. Sad. Thank you for that speech. I'd now like to invite second negative to continue their team's case. Sorry, I just find pirates really funny. Stuff. It's really hard for me. Lucy gets up and says that there are lots of reasons that most pirates are easy to repel. Then Peter gets up and says, look, there are lots of reasons why there are no consequences to being a pirate. So lots of them are really dangerous. What, like, obviously that means there are several types of pirates in this world. My speech is going to follow the structure. Firstly, I'm going to talk about pirates that are reasonably, uh, don't pose a significant threat. Secondly, about those that do, why we're better in both circumstances. And finally, uh, turning back to the principle. So firstly, pirates that we think aren't, don't pose a significant threat. Three big things to say here. The first is that if they don't pose a significant threat, then you are probably already going to choose to uh, to stand your ground because you have a relative power compared to them because you are an armed guard and they probably only have machetes or are on like a rib inflatable so they can't effectively pose a threat to you, right? So it's unclear why that this is such an issue uh, that scare tactics are so effective given a power asymmetry. But secondly, we tell you that current financial disincentives are incredibly effective in this scenario. Peter has two new responses here. Firstly, he says that there's a spectrum of employers, so some of them pay you less. But obviously, a spectrum of employers hire different employees. So if you are working for the shittest company, that's probably because you are the poorest, you can't afford a better job that provides you better protections. So that means you're probably the most...
desperate and the most likely to get uh, to need that money. The second thing Peter says is that it's incredibly hard to enforce a contract. But honestly, what these penalty clauses look like is recouping your damages by not paying people for the work they did for the past week or month. That is an incredibly easy way. You just withhold pay from the employee that failed to actually do the job they were contracted to do. That doesn't require you going to court. It doesn't require anything beyond you just withholding pay. Note that in countries where it is difficult to take something to court, it's probably even less likely that criminal sanctions are going to be effective because the state is highly unlikely to have the resources to go and individually enforce all of these uh, state actions against all these armed guards that are running away from their position compared to the, the actual shipping company that has a direct incentive to recoup their costs, costs. But the final thing to say is even if we don't effectively mitigate uh, every single incident to repel every single pirate, then these are the pirates that don't pose the most significant threat because they are the ones that can't do the worst possible harm because of the characterization that Lucy brings. So ultimately, we don't think that there's a significant harm there. But moving out to the instances where pirates are incredibly dangerous and are incredibly scary because there are several countries um, that, that, you know, where that is the case. We think that Firstly, either criminal sanctions, like I've said before, for reasons of like in inconsistent enforceability are likely to be ineffective, especially against the tangible threat to your life. That means this makes very little change to the affirmative team. Or um, this actually creates terrible inconsistency. Because what does Harry tell you this looks like in practice? In courts of law, reasonable looks like what other people objectively think in regards to your subjective situation. That poses two problems. Firstly, you cannot be sure what the objective reasonable person thinks because you are in a very like heightened state of terror. You can't be sure if you're testing the right thing. But secondly, there are no guidelines that apply to your specific situation because they haven't envisioned it. So that means that people are unable to effectively predict what this requires them and they hesitate. That is incredibly bad, even if the pirate isn't a big risk, which is you don't act early enough to effectively scare them off by firing a few shots. But conversely, in these incredibly dangerous situations, this is a debate winning harm because maybe you don't like actually choose to back off. You feel like you have to put your life on the line. And that means you're incredibly likely to die because note, while the vast majority of people on a container ship do not pose a direct threat to the pirates, so they may not necessarily kill them, they will just subdue them. If you as the armed guard choose to shoot them, you will necessarily have to be like taken out and like incapacitated for them to, you know, take control of that ship. So you have a direct threat to your life. And that is incredibly important in this debate. Peter says, oh, you volunteered for this job, so you don't care. But for, so, so you matter less than other people. Firstly, that is contingent on them proving that a harm accrues to other people which we don't think it does but secondly why should you not care about these employees they are often financially vulnerable because they are going onto shit jobs or they are away from their family from weeks at a time and they have to put their lives on the line these people don't choose this job because they have a deep passion for protecting like shipping containers from pirates they choose it because they have no other options a death here is hugely harmful but the second reason this is bad is because even if you care about other people, antagonizing pirates is the number one way to ensure that you have collateral damage because those pirates are more aggressive when they try to board your ship. They're more likely to fire more shots. That means all those other people are more likely to be hurt when tensions are inflamed. That's debate point. Finally, then turning back Oh, before I move on, I just want to talk about their general effects on piracy, noting two things. Firstly, note that that's contingent on them proving slightly, cons like, somewhat consistent success, which we think is it's unclear that there's a massive increase of on the affirmative. But secondly, lots of examples are just a bit silly, right? You don't have a bazooka, like, you're not sinking the ship, you don't have cannons. These pirates still have resources wherever they came from. And secondly, it's already incredibly risky to be a pirate, so it's unclear there's an increased deterrent effect. Finally, though, on the principle, look, this is principally a in several ways. Firstly, that you are punishing these guards financially as well as criminally, and note how Lucy plays up the impact of criminal sanctions. It looks like having your name on a record so it's more difficult to find a job. That is incredibly harmful for people who are already financially vulnerable. But secondly, note that this is a private role, right? You have not agreed to take on, like, to, to give your life for the state. There's no reason the state should be prosecuting you for this when all you've done is try to serve a job in a private company. It's incredibly unfair for the other team to hold you accountable for something which, you know, that isn't the nature of the job that you've agreed to. But finally, like Harry puts out in his speech, other remedies are appropriate. And where other remedies are appropriate, the criminal law should not be resorted to. We think that criminally sanctioned guards in these circumstances is abhorrent, very proud to negate. Thanks for that speech. And now I'd like to invite Nick reply.
Okay, just checking on here, heard. As we set out to you at the start of this debate, the risks of being a pirate are already very high. It is already very scary. You already take significant risks in doing so. As such, as we very clearly explained to you at first, you only take this risk at the point you lack other options or <clears throat> view it as the best possible option. The consequence of this is, is there's already massive disincentives that have been overcome in order to become a pirate to begin with, and it's unclear why the fact that guards are maybe marginally more likely, although we don't think that's proven, <clears throat> to stand their ground will ever be a sufficient disincentive for you to. That's if they even know about it, which, as we explained to you at first, is unlikely. That means they need to show a very strong deterrent effect to claim any of their benefits in this debate. I'm going to note one more principle. As we've just explained to you to no response, which is a concession um, by the affirmative team, that principally the criminal law should be restricted to areas where there are no appropriate alternatives. We've explained to you very clearly why there are very effective alternatives available to you, why, <clears throat> why companies can recoup their losses, why they can refuse to pay, and why it is fundamentally not an obligation that you have taken up on becoming a private security guard. It's principally abhorrent to... Um, expand the criminal law where we have where we have other options we have other options we should, ought not expand it i'm going to do two things in the rest of this speech first i'm going to deal with when pirates are no threat second i'm going to deal with bad pirates now the material that <laughs> you get from the affirmative team with regard to pirates are no threat is somewhat unclear right because they tell you that there are lots of private security companies on um, going around on these boats that just like run away at the first sign of um, the first sign of a fight. The first thing you should question at the start of this, as we've explained to you down the bench, is why anyone is hiring these companies. Because like presumably, if we're aware that these companies are a bit shit and like you know we are not engaged in this, it's a pretty well known fact. As such, there's a pretty strong disincentive to ever waste your money hiring these people. But then, as Grace explains to you, the types of people that get hired by the worst of these companies that pay the least are also likely to be the ones with the least other options, which means they're the ones that are likely to be most desperate. And as I explained to you at first, when you're very desperate in this industry, that's when you're likely to stay on your ground. That means that the, that the economic incentives in the case where there are weak pirates are likely going to be relatively, <clears throat> are likely going to be very, very strong against this already, right? As such, like, and this is assuming that this debate even comes into effect because most guards are probably going to just stand their ground and make it and like make the not very scary pirates go away. Finally, as we explained to you, it's unclear what the harm of these not very scary pirates is anyway. Then on bad pirates. First, I'm going to note, they don't get to claim their benefit of getting rid of the worst of these pirates. We've explained to you why that's unrealistic. They need to, to prove a much bigger disincentive. We've also explained to you why it makes them more dangerous, because, <laughs> because when there's a reasonable standard applied, which is a very hard to apply, it's much more likely that you're going to see guards standing their ground in situations where it's not appropriate. You're going to see more guards getting killed, and more, and you're also going to see more other people getting killed in the crossfire because there's now a higher tension scenario. It's unclear how you solve this problem. The Guards are already well-placed to make a decision. They already have a sufficiently strong disincentive. The criminal law isn't appropriate. We ought not apply it. Thanks for that speech. I'd now like to invite the AFRA reply. In that case is simultaneously that there is no need for an extra incentive because people already act sufficiently. And when you add the additional incentive of the criminal sanction, guards are way more likely to act in ways which they go up against those pirates. I think the second thing is more likely to be the thing that happens in this debate because we've explained to you how the effect of the criminal sanction is really impactful on them. Given that, I think we should care, even to the extent that all of their material is true, I think you should care far more about the people who are impacted by piracy than the guards. And the reason for that is that the harms on their side are concentrated on a small group of people who maybe don't have another a lot of options, but still chose to be an armed guard under their side. The comparative is a world full of people who exponentially suffer more from thriving piracy. People who are soft targets, people who have no ability to protect themselves, we think it's perfectly reasonable 
possible for us to prioritize those people above all else. And that's where that principle comes into play, right? Because Harry says that, that you have you shouldn't use the criminal sanction where there are other options. There are no other options here. The criminal sanction is the only way to get people to act in a way which stops piracy. We therefore should win the debate. Two points. Firstly, on the incentive to protect the ship. And secondly, on why pirates are bad. On the incentive to protect the ship. We already, at, at their own material concedes this point, right? They explain to us why people are really scared of the criminal sanction and so are likely to behave in a way which means they go up against these pirates and we think because they know that there is an incentive for reasonability like there is an act of reasonability there maybe sometimes they go a little bit too far we think in the majority of cases they they balance those incentives better they are better able to make those decisions they say that financial incentives are already enough but as we told you there are lots of shit companies who do bad jobs and those companies even though they don't get a lot of good finance like when you pay a company not very much you probably don't have the capacity to write a really giant financial penalty clause in their contract right so they can walk away and do nothing the comparative is a world in which it's way easier to just get the captain to arrest you when you dock at the port because you ran away as comparative to a world where you can just go insolvent as the company and avoid those financial incentives there was always going to be more incentive on our side that's conceded by their own material why do we then stop pirates we say we don't care if you are overly cautious and go too far because the existence of the opportunity to make money from pirates allows them to exist. The comparative is a world in which pirates who are brutal because they require scare tactics in order to be successful, so will always be brutal, also because they don't care about the US Navy because the US Navy doesn't care about them being brutal. All of those things mean that when you do it, make it more likely that you stand up against you and you make the easily repellable attacks no longer occur, you make it on the margins less capable for them to be able to get money. The impact of that is relatively obvious, right? When the ship goes out, doesn't make any money, the people who work there no longer want to work there as much maybe in some instances they've already bought into some degree of risk but obviously this is a debate about the margins and we think if we there are slightly less pirates there that just leads to less innocent passenger ferries being kidnapped and their best case is that pirates aren't brutal they just take hostages we should avoid people being had in the capacity to take hostages we always care about those people more we don't care about the security guards who paid to, who are already getting paid to do the job they should just do it Thanks, everyone. This is a silent round, so bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.